thank you to everyone who's joined us this evening. It's our first um, book club of 2022, so it's delightful to have you all here. And the biggest thank you, of course, is to our guest today, who is Gabriel Hemery, someone who needs very little introduction to most of you, but I am going to introduce him. Um, so Gabriel is a, an author, a tree photographer. He's a chartered forester. Um, he's written a number of technical articles. And in 2009, he uh, co-founded the charity, the Silver Foundation, of which he is the uh, chief executive officer. So this wonderful book, which I hope most of you have read, and if you haven't, there is an, uh, now a new compact version available. Um, the new silver is the topic for most of our discussion tonight. But I do know Gabriel has a new project um, on forest guides. So at the end of the evening, we're just going to spend a few minutes about that and how you can perhaps get involved with Gabriel on that project. Um, so Gabriel, turning to you, if I may, um, we're, we're here to talk about the new silver. And um, I think perhaps the starting place should be with John Evelyn, who was obviously the inspiration 350 years before your own book. Um, and then I, I will talk about that for a few minutes and then I will start to open up the uh, conversation to the audience. So if you do have a burning question for Gabriel, please, as Claire says, put it in the chat function and we'll try and come to you. Uh, I do have a few submitted questions as well, which I might be able to pop in. And Gabriel will, during the evening, be giving us a reading or two and um, a, a little bit more of an explanation about some of the fabulous illustrations that um, I'm sure you've all enjoyed. So, Gabriel, let's start a little for a moment with John, John Evelyn, a, a man living in extraordinary times at a time when we had civil war, there was the plague. We didn't have Carl Linnaeus and the classification system. Darwin hadn't talked about evolution. Printing was extraordinarily expensive. And yet you had this man who wrote this book with illustrations and it went to reprints and reprints and reprints. So, you know, just, just your thoughts on John Evelyn, whether there's been anyone like him and whether perhaps he was um, a little bit ahead of his time when he was advocating sustainable forestry. So over to you, Gabriel, just tell thank us about John. Well, I should say good evening, everybody, and uh, thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, and it's so lovely to see so many familiar faces and so many people I hugely respect. So I'm feeling very daunted. Um, I see someone is all, all, also clinging on to a, a copy of the book. So I expect to be given a hard time, particularly by some people I can see on my screen. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the evening and for a good discussion. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks for giving up your evening to, to talk with us. I'm going to share my screen actually, just why I respond to that that point, Claire. So, uh, if this helps a bit, yeah. So uh, John Eben was an amazing gentleman. He he was a, a real polymath. Um, interestingly, he was alive and working while um, Samuel Pepys was very busy recording Life in London in the 17th century. And Pepys' initial impre impression of him was was that he was perhaps a little bit conceited, but then he allowed the fact that he actually was a very intelligent and skillful person. Um, and it, they actually became quite close over time. And I think um, it was a good relationship. So yeah, Evening was uh, effectively, he went to study the bar, but decided to uh, not to follow that, uh, that career and ended up uh, actually uh, leaving to go on a tour of Europe while um, the Civil War raged. Um, but he was alive and busy as a civil servant, particularly writing papers on everything from coinage uh, to stamps uh, to smog in London. And it was a kind of a natural choice for um, the, the king, King Charles II, and uh, the civil service requirement at the time for a report looking at the state of the nation's forests. Because, of course, then timber was a strategic importance to the country. Uh, with the French and Dutch wars and so on in the, um, in the recent past, there's a real need to think about growing more and growing better timber. And it's in that light, really, that uh, this report first came together from the queries uh, looking at the state of forests for producing timber for um, the Navy. Um, came this report, first put together in 1662, 
uh, and actually then produces a book in 1664. And, and what we know is that actually, although even his name's on it, he most definitely worked with others at the time who supported him doing this work. Uh, but I think what was fascinating, I think for all of us with an interest in trees and forestry, was that he was at the he was one of the founding members. In fact, member number nine um, of 40 or so founding members of the Royal Society. And if you think who was alive and busy at the time, um, Sir Isaac Newton, Christopher Boyle, Robert Wren, it wasn't uh, astrophysics or chemistry um, that the Royal Society first commissioned a report on. Oh no, it was trees and forestry and timber. Um, and I think for me personally, that's that was a, a real eye opener into the importance that trees have had for the nation and our history. And I think personally that we're going to full circle and we're going to end up in the same place, but in a very different way. And that's partly why I was so passionate to write uh, an updated version of his, of his silver. So the first uh, co the first edition of this book came out in 2014, which was the 350th celebration of the book. So thank, thank you for that, Gabriel. Um, everyone, don't forget to put your questions in, but I'm going to come to you, Gabriel, with the first question. Uh, this is actually from our um, Chief Executive, Chris Williams, who would have loved to have been here, but is stuck on a train somewhere between Leeds and home. Um, and it really is relevant to what you've just been saying. Uh, he said, um, there's a whole story behind the journey of this book. What was the legacy for you personally? Did it change the way you think about forestry? Gosh, that's a, that's a good question. I, um, as ever, you never know enough in life, do you? And there's not enough time in a single lifetime to learn everything you'd like to learn. Um, for me, it was a, the discipline of sitting down and trying to translate uh, a huge amount of really good scientific information published in journals, the amazing classic books by Troop and others about civil cultural systems. But my, my passion, as I might come out in a reading in a moment, is was trying to find a way for that information and for the knowledge of forestry to have a general public audience. So I wasn't in any way trying to compete with the, the great authors who've written about forestry in a technical way, uh, but to try and translate some of that information without dumbing it down too much into a general um, audience. Uh, publication. So that was my challenge. And I think I learned a huge amount about being a communicator in that role. And, you know, even working with the, the team in Bloomsbury, who are the publishers, to explain to them what I was trying to say and why, and why it's important, and to sort of fight my case for what I wanted to go in the book, even from the very start, to argue the case for what, what was in it and what sort of book it needed to be. Um, I wanted a book with gravitas, with weight, with some sort of seriousness, but at the same time to be something beautiful and compelling for the general public audience. So that's quite a challenge to get that in a single volume, I think. So thank you. I'm just going to ask you another thing which is related to this. And again, I'm afraid it comes from Chris. Um, well, I'm not afraid. I'm delighted it comes from Chris. He says that uh, you make it clear in your book that you want to stimulate the discussion and the development of a stronger wood culture. Um, so how do you feel that's going in the sort of intervening years since, since this has come out? Mm. Uh, I don't think we're doing terribly well. I mean, it's at the heart of uh, creating Silver Foundation was this idea that we would uh, find ways to engage general public in the wood culture. Um, but I, I know it's a challenge. I mean, I'll give you an example. Very recently, I was speaking to a very major national charity about a project, it's very exciting. It involves using timber uh, grown in Britain. And some parts of that conversation were all around the concerns of public opinion around felling trees. So there's lots of comfort and joy and celebration in communications around planting trees. Uh, and it's, I think, a, a, an easy or possibly lazy way through the communication challenges we have. I, I want to see national charities and others celebrating the felling of a tree and the using of that timber. So given the fact that this was a nationally important charity, I find that very challenging that they're so nervous about public opinion for felling a tree. Even everything around that, that project was perfect in the fact that it's a sustainably managed woodland, it's 
got a management plan in place. It's been a, the felling's been approved by state. Um, it's got a home to go to the timber. It's going to be FSC. All the tick boxes are there for the very fact. In fact, also it was um, uh, afflicted by ash dieback. So there was a dare I say an excuse to fell that tree. So I, I was, have been very vociferous with that body to saying, I don't want you to use the excuse of ash dieback to say that's why the tree was cut down. Because that's, that's the opposite of what we should be talking about. We should be celebrating the fact that tree was planted by a forester, cared for by a forester, looked after by the landowner, invested in by the landowner. And now we're fenning it and we're fenning it sustainably. We're going to make something from that tree and then we'll do the tree planting. But the tree planting is not the thing you shout about. It's the growing of the timber that's most I think, important. I think a lot of people will, will recognise those, those, those thoughts there, Gabriel. Um, just before I ask you for your first reading, I just want to turn to Ed Dolphin, if you can um, unmute yourself, Ed. Um, you have a question which is sort of related to what we're just talking about here. Well, I was interested to hear Gabriel talking about the publisher. I've dealt with publishers. And how, I want to say, no, not how easy was it, how difficult was it to convince them to actually go ahead with the project? Yeah, um, I, I, I was very lucky in, um, I wrote in the coattails of my co-author, Sarah Simblet, who, once you have a publishing record, it's, it's very much easier. Uh, if I'd gone alone, I think I wouldn't have had any doors open to me. So with Sarah and her amazing art uh, and history of book publishing, it, we were um, well placed. Um, so we had a good agent, we pitched together, we had four publishers pitching for the book. So it's almost the other way around than I feared. Uh, and we were able to pick the one that got it and Bloomsby by a long way got it. As I mentioned earlier, this idea of something with a bit of gravitas and something to celebrate the history as well as you know, the, the depth of forestry. And they really got it. You know, they, they put a lot of uh, energies and effort into trying to create the right sort of looking book. Um, and they were prepared to invest time to do that. Um, others at the start were saying, well, you, you can't have a book with no photographs in it. You know, that's not a done thing anymore. And I say, no, no, we don't want photographs. We don't, you know. And interestingly, Wendy said earlier, the, the, the silver was illustrated. Actually, the first edition wasn't. There were no illustrations other than the frontispiece. Only subsequently, um, various engravings started to come into different editions. So this new silver with 200 drawings was a, you know, a very much um, different proposition, really. Um, and also, Blooms, we were prepared to accept a rather unusual offer, which uh, is probably worth explaining because people get a little bit confused. So I wrote the book in my own time as a fundraiser and profile raiser for silver and for forestry generally. Um, the, the deal to try and get the, um, the drawing done, there, there is no publisher on earth that would commission 200 um, specially drawn um, illustrations. So the deal was that I persuaded them to, um, for Silver Foundation to take on Sarah Simblet as artist in residence. And in return, the publisher would allow Silver Foundation to sell the book directly itself. Um, and receive that profile. So the sales of the book have been then paying back our investment as a charity in the artists in residence. And it's worked well for us now, you know, a few years later, it's worked. Um, so yeah, Bloomsbury are brilliant to deal with. And I, I've got a photo at some point and I'll show you, when I show you how the book was put together uh, of us meeting in the woods with the publishers, which is an unusual thing, I think. Great question, Ed. All right, so just, just I hope that answers everything, Ed. Um, just before we move to that um, little presentation and the information about the illustrations, which I think will be fascinating, Gabriel, could I just ask you just to read us a little bit from the, the introduction to the reader? Um, of course. And that will set the, scene, set the scene, really. I've got my, this the, just in case people want, this is the original version, which was 2014, so it's sort of that scale. If you've seen it, only come across a book recently, it's a little bit smaller. So it's a, a, blue, a blue spine, slightly less luxurious, but half the price. Anyway, the words are the same. Um, so I'm gonna read from the introduction, which is to the reader. Um, I hope it's not too long an excerpt, but um, I think it's important to set the scene. 
Society today is ever more removed from the natural world. Children rarely play unsupervised in our woodlands. People surround themselves with items made from wood, but feel unease at the sound of a chainsaw in a forest. Public perceptions of forestry are often negative, and there is a deep misunderstanding of the working countryside. Many of our forests lie unmanaged, while timber is imported from overseas or substituted with man-made materials. This is our wood culture, and it is moribund. Yet there's an important, if not unprecedented, role for trees, forests, and timber today. As society continues to experience environmental change, trees will become ever more valued and needed, not only as beautiful elements shaping landscapes and city parks, affirming our sense of place and heritage, but also perhaps our most important natural resource. Trees are intertwined with humanity. They supported the cradle of civilization and frame all of our lives. We know there could be no life on earth without them, but in our actions, we often overlook their value. In creating the new silver, we hope to inspire people to embrace and revitalize our wood culture, to plant a tree, to marvel at the beauty and richness of a woodland, to understand the art and science of forestry, to feel pride in using timber sourced from a well-managed forest. Generations to come will judge our society according to the utility of our forests and the love and respect we afford our trees. Thank you, Gabriel. I'm sure um, people will appreciate those sentiments. Um, I'm going to come back to the subject that we've talked about already, which are the illustrations, because I don't think that we can really talk about the new silver without understanding how the illustrations came into being. And I know it's a fascinating story um, and they give so much to the book. I think I read somewhere that Sarah was actually holding a sample with one hand while writing with the other. Um, and, and I'm just in complete awe of what she's managed to achieve. So perhaps I know you have a few slides you could tell us about what was a very, very intricate process really, wasn't it, to get all these together? It was. I'll, um... Yes, you might have to stop me, but I'll just I'll whiz through them and then get, get, get in. I think it's so lovely to see the making process. So these are some slides we put together um, when the book you know, was coming together. Um, uh, this is Sarah in the field. Uh, this is in that was in Breckford Forest in South Wales. Um, and this is me when I was much younger, um, somewhere in Scotland, I think Loch um, And and yeah, as I said, Sarah's sort of background was that she became well known for botany for the artists, but before that was a human anatomist um, artist. So uh, Sarah will forgive me because I've said this before in front of her. This, this is Sarah's idea of a spreadsheet. So um, it, it, this is a really interesting process of sort of getting together and marking out the book so you can see sort of chapter headings and and sub chapter headings on the left and a sort of big matrix trying to decide how we cut up and dice up uh, everything I wanted to say uh, so this is quite fun uh, and then really the magic began uh, but before that and as, as to Ed's question earlier how we pitched it we used some of Sarah's original drawing uh, sorry, existing drawings from other work she'd done and pitched this idea so along with the sort of extracts of text that I wrote so produce these lovely little thumbnail sketches uh, just showing what the spreads might look like, sort of capture the spirit of the book. And to see it produce these, it, it's just magic for your eyes. Each one appeared in a sort of a minute, um, but captured, I mean, almost, it, they, they look almost like the final book did. So <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so yes, as you know, I've, I mentioned, we, we pitched to Bloomsbury and they, we, we decided to go with them. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do is to get the editorial team out in the woods. So uh, thanks to Blenheim Palace, we went to visit uh, uh, one of the oldest oaks we know of in the country, so over a thousand years old. And I think what really blew their minds was the fact that this tree was already 500 years old when Evelyn was writing his book. And that instantly, you don't have to say anything else. If you say that to any member of the public, the concept of longevity and forward vision and the, this idea of forestry being like the world's slowest relay races when you're passing a baton between generations. I mean, that, that captures everything about the investment we as forest managers and landowners put into uh, caring for trees. 
So um, that was a very productive thing to have done. Uh, and then we got about thinking about the design. So these sort of sketches Sarah produced with a big uh, felt pen, just trying to capture the idea of, you know, maybe some spreads showing botanical parts, other ones showing tree portraits. And then these were sort of mocked up into details of what these might look like. Uh, so we could share those with the publishers. And, and then uh, Sarah took this in quite an old fashioned way, which is fascinating for me to watch, of actually producing then these little miniature spreads that you could sh uh, shuffle around to decide how the flow of the book might look. Um, and then that became the sort of the flat plan, as we call it. So where we know on what spread, which sort of section is starting. And that became our Bible, really, for, for me to know how many words I had to write, for her to know what drawings to draw on what scale. And we pitched that to the publishers. This is us in uh, what I jokingly always called the Harry Potter um, offices in London with thick carpets paid for by um, uh, Bloomsbury's investment in Harry Potter. So anyway, lovely team to work with. And this was um, us pitching to them the idea of the book in detail. And I had the privilege of working close with Sarah, you know, producing these drawings. So these were her, her tools of the trade. Um, if I was in a, a, a real audience with you, I might ask you what you think the feathers are for, because it's always an interesting question. Uh, the answer is to brush away the eraser uh, rubbings. Um, anyway, so this is us. Uh, amazingly, Sarah is building her own house at the same time. So these, this is us working on the flat plan. Um, and you can just see uh, a finished drawing here, the first one. And bit by bit, the drawings start to come together. I had the amazing privilege of deciding what I wanted to be captured and then sort of almost like an most amazing camera um, working with an artist who could produce these images. And the reason that for me drawings are so important is that they can lead the viewer to see the things that you want them to see in a way that photographs make, uh, don't, aren't so good at doing that. So it's a very powerful process of, I guess, an educative, educative role in, in, in using good art in that way. Uh, and this is some Blenheim Palace looking at drawings. Uh, we looked at this um, very ancient uh, hazel coppice, uh, massively overstood, as you can see. Um, we went down to the Surrey Hills uh, to see some of the, the more mature elms. These are two Cornish elms. Uh, and that's a finished drawing. Uh, we had other tree portraits like this field oak in Oxfordshire, uh, limes in a, an estate in Oxfordshire. Um, a cedar in a country park. We went searching for botanical parts. This is in uh, Western Burt, finding male and female cones at different heights through the tree and working with Forest Research to help us do that. We went and searched for the, the again, I'd ask you if we could in an easy way, what you think this tree is. I suspect it fox most of you. This is in a, next to a, a leisure center that thousands of people walk by and would never notice. But this is one of Britain's rarest trees. It's a Plymouth pear in this sort of scattering of little tiny branches in the hedge. Uh, and that's a drawing that Sarah made of that for the book. We went to uh, Chequers to look at box woodlands. Uh, I wanted to depict working woodlands and laid hedgerows, uh, timber in a sawmill. Um, and then this little sequence I was keen to show you because it shows the depth of thinking behind um, a single spread. So this is common walnut. And it's in the background, you've got a, a life size uh, spread with a fold down the middle. And what Sarah's doing here is working out how we could get um, walnut foliage and flowers and fruit to appear on a single spread. So she's taken one that she likes and starting to cut and manipulate it do a bit of gardening if you like. Um, and this is starting to take shape. And then as uh, Wendy said earlier, her way of working, and it's really interesting to hear her talk about this. I wish she could be here with me. It's not just the fact that she's holding it to look at it. She always talks about how she gets something very physical from the holding of the item. And it really helps her understand how it's, what its form and shape is like. So this is a very important part of her process. And you see the pencil drawing in the background coming together. Uh, here are the erasings that I talked about earlier with the, the brush off of the feather. So she's beginning to ink in the detail of this same walnut drawing. This is it nearly finished. You can see, uh, sorry, uh, some unfilled in leaves and so on, but you can see the male catkins and female flowers, the leaves and so on. Uh, and there it is in the, in the book. 
And what I just want to highlight was, it might have missed your attention, but in the fold, in the fold here, you, if you now you know, you will notice it, but it's designed in such a way that no part of that drawing other than the stem that passes through it is interrupted by the fold. And for the uninformed, you probably never notice. But if you go back a few stages, there's a line look here. That's the fold. So that the whole drawing right from the very start was designed in such a way that it would fit this book and this shape and this size. So I always like showing that one. Uh, a few other quick uh, illustrations um, beyond the sort of tree portraits and woodland images we had uh, tree fruit, so this is some Bramley apples, flowers like these cherry sprigs, uh, quince, um, and a really great trip we had together going up to Scotland to find some granny pines uh, working below freezing for a day in a forest with an artist was a new experience for me. Uh, this is Sarah wearing all my coats as well as hers, so I had to run around to keep warm for eight hours. Uh, but this is the result in drawing, it's an amazing image of uh, uh, native Caledonian pine wood in the snow and the granny pine uh, working from tents in the rain and snow uh, on the lock shore looking at downy birch visiting Benwell tent gardens and the wonderful uh, uh, giant redwoods and and then back into the lab so this is uh if you look at the I don't know if you can see my mouse but on the slide here is a, a one-year-old uh, pine cone so a female flower using a cone of Scots pine. At that age, it's the size of your small fingernail. So this is a single slice of cells through it that Sarah's looking in, in a binocular uh, microscope and then drawing it many, many times larger than life on this amazing image, which you may have seen in the book. So you can see even at one years old, that this is the fingernail size uh, originally, you can just see if you can see, can you see my mouse, Wendy? Maybe you can nod. Yeah, so you can see the, the seed here and the wing in its developmental stage. Um, so the most amazing drawings. And then other sort of microscopic ones like um, um, catkins here, or older catkins, and even uh, mycorrhizal uh, competition in an agar plate. Uh, I think I really stretched Sarah's skills to the limit here, asking her to try and capture fungi. At, in action, so, uh, <laughs> and a few other quick ones. So I keep going, Wendy. Yeah, please do, yeah. I, well, I'm fascinated. I hope everyone else is. Okay. Um, you've, you've already very kindly shown two of my favorite ones. So oh. um, <laughs> please, so, please carry on, yeah. Right, okay. Well, I, I also wanted to depict, you know, some of the other aspects of forestry and land management, which is not all about growing trees, of course, but the other benefits we derive from our good from good water management, which might include sporting rights. So, um, Rather than having a pheasant, we decided to go with a woodcock, which sort of has its own story around it. So we managed to um, acquire a frozen woodcock and day after day, Sarah would take it out of the freezer and draw it as it slowly defrosted and puffed up and began to smell. And then she'd pop it back in the freezer again. But she came up with this most beautiful drawing. It's actually one of my favourite birds. It's crepuscular in habit, which is also one of my favourite words. So it's active at dawn and dusk. Uh, and comes over from Scandinavia in November, hence uh, the nickname for the November is called the, uh, the never, November full moon, it's called the Woodcock Moon. And they have this amazing 360 vision. And of course, they've got a um, uh, wonderful cryptic camouflage as well. Anyway, I'm going to get ornithological. On you no, now. that's great. Birds uh, as well as trees tonight, folks. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, so this is the final drawing. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, and it, it's a sad thing that the bird is dead. It's an amazing illustration for the book. And then very cleverly, uh, as I wanted to show you as well, the designers decided to um, use sort of spare parts. So I say spare, obviously Sarah had to draw these feathers, uh, which fell out as she was working on the bird. But the designer used it to lighten what I might say is, unless you're particularly interested in, in this case, wood pulp and cellulose. Um, the general reader might have been rather bored by a, a large double spread of me getting excited about wood pulp. So they've lightened the text and improved the look of it by using drawings like this to improve the, uh, the appeal of the book. Uh, and this came, comes a page after the woodcock. So you, you look at the woodcock, turn the page and a few feathers drift through the book. And then a page after there'll be another few feathers less. In a similar way, things like this wild strawberry and the runners um, lighten the look of the book and the text. 
Um, one day, Sarah was drawing in her in her house, which I mentioned to you earlier, was she was working on at the time. So a migration of toads came under her front door and out, out of her back door. So one by one, she temporarily imprisoned the, the toads and drew these little sketches about a minute each. Um, and these were used in the book in this way, in, in the same way, really, to lighten the text. In this case, I'm getting excited by thinning by the looks. <laughs> I was um, waiting for those toads to come up, Gabriel. So are we near near the end of Yeah, I'm near there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and last of all, sort okay. of, I, I think it's nice to show us work in the field on different yeah. systems. So this is us visiting uh, Devon and Westman's Wood. And I thought, if I may, Wendy, this might be a good one to hold up now. Please so, do. Um, this is a, a high altitude acid oak woodland in, in Devon. It's one of three woodlands in, in, on Dartmoor. And what I wanted to show you was this is the final drawing here. I think what I might do is switch off my thing now and just show you the scale because these are much bigger than the, in the book. So this is the actual, this is the original here. So Silver's lucky enough to own, uh, I think it's 80 of these as a sort of long-term investment. Um, so they are something like 30% bigger than they are in the book. So uh, I'll just hold it up and you can see maybe a bit closer to the camera, sort of the, if you're into art, you can see some of the details on how her marks look and so on. But I've got a few more things I can show you if they're of interest. I think, Wendy, that might have been it. I'll just check while... No, that's, I mean, that's lovely. I, yeah. I, I, I'm going to ask you, though, do you have a favourite drawing of all of them? Uh, well, I've been a bit of a walnut, too, I suppose I should say the walnut one. Um, uh, well, that's that's going to be very useful because that's going to be my next question to you. So ah. <laughs> that's a lovely <laughs> link through. Um, so having talked about the amazing drawings, and I hope everyone's found that a really, really interesting part of how this, this amazing book has been created. Um, I thought we'd start to talk a little bit about... Um, some of the content of the book. And um, this is actually a question I have because I have a particular love for uh, walnuts and mulberries. And I hadn't realized when I thought of this um, that actually this is your specialist area, walnuts. Um, but in the book, you, they both produce compounds that ward off insects, you say. Um, and they both have a future to play in agroforestry. Um, so my question to you is, is having, having written the book, sort of what evidence is there that they're being taken out? And are there any results of walnut trials? Um, I think you mentioned or referenced Paradise Wood and National Forest that, that you can talk about here. Yeah. Um, well, yes. I mean, it's it, one lifetime is not enough, really, to make a lot of impact in tree research, as I'm sure many people here with a research background will be very aware of. Um, so yeah, I started my journey on walnut. So I did um, a defil at Oxford uh, with Peter Saville, um, looking at the silviculture and genetics of walnut. And uh, I travelled, was lucky enough to travel to Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia, actually supported by a Randall Travel Bursary. Thank you, RFS. Um, so this is back in uh, 1996. So pretty much the start of my serious career, I guess. Um, in forestry. I spent a few years working in land management for that. So yeah, thanks to the RFS really. I, I, off I tripped to Kyrgyzstan and ended up collecting uh, from single, uh, what we call plus trees, which are sort of um, really good quality single specimen trees all across Kyrgyzstan, which is the most amazing place. If you don't know much about it, it's very mountainous. It's got 230,000 hectares of pure walnut forest. Can I imagine going to the Chilterns and instead of beach, you're looking at walnut as far as the eye can see, and every single tree is a walnut. There's not a single other tree of any sort anywhere other than in the understory where you get apple, pear, and plum. So it's really the Garden of Eden and the sort of origins of a lot of our fruit and apple trees. Not mulberry though, Wendy. Um, so I, yeah, I was there collecting what well, I was hoping to find really good timber trees. And I did find some extraordinary naturally grown walnuts uh, for those, um, I can see William on my image. I know that William gets excited by this. So we're looking at something like eight or 10 meters of clear stem. Um, this is walnut we're talking about, gun barrel straight, and it's never seen a pruning saw in its life. And that's growing wild in the mountains at 2000 meters above sea level. 
So I got very excited by finding trees like that. I'd collect the seed, I brought, it, brought them all back. I planted out in Paradise Wood and at two other sites in Southern England. I have to say the results uh, aren't brilliant. They're, they're all alive, but they're not growing particularly well here. One of the challenges is the latitude difference between Kyrgyzstan and here. So we were hoping at the time that the, the altitudinal difference would really help. So you collect from high altitude further south, and when you bring them further north, you drop in altitude, it might work. They're doing better in Somerset and less well in Oxfordshire. Uh, I hope in time someone will still have the data and go around the trees as they're growing and start to do more technical research with it. I'm sure using the latest advances in clonal technology that might be there in a generation's time and producing amazingly good quality fast growing walnuts would be um, something that make me very happy in my dotage. So you never know. Thank you. Um... I have a question. I'm going to ask William if he wants to come back to you. And thank you for the plug on the Randall Travel Bursary. With travel opening up again, um, we do have the Travel Bursary back up. So just check out the website. Um, but uh, we have a question from Jamie. Jamie Balfour Paul. Don't know if you're there. Just referencing one of the pictures you showed before. Jamie, would you like to unmute yourself and, and have a chat to Gabriel? Oh, hi, Gabriel. I just wondered what the, you mentioned the, the woodlands in Devon, I think on Dartmoor. Do, do you have the details of where they are, what they're called? Hello, Jamie. We've been emailing recently, haven't we? So it's nice to meet you. Um, there, there are three high altitude <coughs> woodlands in, on Dartmoor. So Wisman's Wood is a better known one. It's a travel SI, and that's quite near two bridges in the middle of the moor. And there's one called Piles Copse, which is on the River Urn to the south. Uh, which is uh, not quite so old, but uh, a little bit more extensive. And the smallest and hardest to reach is in the north, um, and that's called Black, Black Tor Beer, B-E-A-R-E. -E. And that's on the River Ock, just near Oakhampton. Um, and so this what, could be a wonderful what, prompt for me to go, go off on one around rewilding, but there are basically tiny remnants of uh, ancient oak woodland that once would have covered the whole of Dartmoor. Um, but sadly, because of the grazing regime and farming subsidies and everything else, they're hanging on to life amongst the clitter, as they call it, the boulders underneath the talls. And that's the only reason they're still there, because the sheep and ponies and cattle can't reach them. So I missed the name of the second one. Um, Wisman's Wood, Piles Copse right. and Blackator Beer. And I'm just going to bring in, I think, Esmond, you'd raised a hand there. Did you want to come in on this discussion? Do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, you're, you're on mute, Esmond. You need to just unmute the, the little, the little um, button. There you are. Yes, I, I know those three woods on Dartmoor quite well. It is, of course, Duchy of Cornwall land. And I think I'm right in saying those three woods are actually planted. They are pedunculate, as um, Gabriel says in the book. Uh, and you'd expect sessile there. But That's I right. think they're actually plantations originally, though they hardly look like that now. Yes, you're right, Esmond. There's a lot of debate around their origins. Mm. Um, and you would expect to have um, sessile because of the acidic yeah. soils on Dartmoor, you know. Yeah. Can I just make another point, Wendy? Um, yeah, going, back, do. going back to the walnuts. Um, before I went into forestry, I worked for an artist class making handmade furniture. And one of the most interesting days I had with him, um, Edward Barnsley was his name, was to go out and buy walnut trees, um, which were brought back and sawn up and seasoned, air seasoning, of course. All the trees that we found that were worth buying were in farmyards. And I think that is because walnut uh, likes a high nitrogen content. Yes, definitely. So that's why uh, we didn't really talk about walnut silviculture, but I, I dabbled for a few years in um, the idea of mixing with nitrogen fixing nurse species. So uh, alder being one, um, Eleagnus and Bellata being another, um, to see if we could improve the growing conditions for walnut. They're really tricky to grow because they need lots of light and space, as I'm sure you're aware, but equally they don't like to be exposed to the wind, they like to be sheltered. Um, and warm 
and they need lots of nitrogen, as you say. Um, I think Gerard put it most uh, eloquently. So this is the Gerard of 1597, I'm quoting now, that walnuts did best on fat and fruitful ground. So <laughs> anything around a farmyard with cow manure and deep rootable soils, you will be rewarded. Yeah. So if you've got um, a good farm, you put your walnuts on the best soil on your good farm, not anywhere else. You're wasting your time. Um, and then if you care for them, nurture them, um, the very you spoil them and they'll reward you, basically. Um, I'm just going to go for another quick question, sticking with the walnuts for a moment, um, from Clive Ellis. Clive, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Um, where are you? Are you there? Yeah. Do you want to ask your question? Hello, Clive. Hello, oh, it's been ages. Uh, yeah, my question is, I was just wondering if you think that the site in in uh, Paradise Wood was a bit cold compared to the Somerset one, and what was the, where was the other place that you mentioned? Um, I think um, there was another. Yeah, so there's, um, it depends which, we got multiple different trials planted in different places, so some are genetic, some are silvicultural. I, yeah, I think the Paradise Wood is tricky because it's quite a clay site, so it's a sandy clay loam, a little bit waterlogged, um, had a long history of cultivation. Um, and I think that there were issues with the soil fertility, I think, in, in that situation. Somerset Levels was planted in, planted in pasture, deeply rootable, and they were growing you know, twice as fast there. I have, I've lost touch with it because now the research is being managed by the Future Trees Trust, but um, I, I don't know their state, but I know they were growing a lot better when I last measured them down there. Um, I have planted walnuts in the National Forest uh, which is obviously further north, um, including on some rather nasty reclaimed sites. And there we used um, nitrogen fixing nurses that really helped. I think a question popped up, Wendy, by someone asking about how far north they'll grow. They have. I was just going to ask you, I think, Brian Elliott. Brian, if you're there, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, hi. Um, hi, Gabriel. Um, how, how, what's the exposure of these walnuts? I've seen some... Um, up in Penrith, and they're looking pretty bad. Uh, is the exposure a real issue for them? Um, yes. Where do you think they'll grow up to? Well, I mean, it's got, they'll grow in Scotland, um, but I think you used the word flourish, and, and that's the important word here. So <laughs> they will survive and hang on in some pretty severe uh, environments. But if you want to grow quality walnut, the further south you go in the, and the more, uh, the richer the conditions that you can grow it, the better. So if I was going to invest in walnut, I certainly wouldn't be heading north. I'd be heading south. Yeah, I've Thank got a you. I've got a walnut here, which is about um, it's about fifty years of age, and it looks about one hundred and fifty. It's, <laughs> it's that ragged. Right. Lovely. Okay, I think we're going to leave walnuts now, and I'm going to go to Tom K um, for a moment. Just going back to the talking about celebrating felling, um, and then Gabriel, I'll ask you for your second reading, if that's possible. So Tom, if you'd <laughs> sure. like to just um, unmute yourself. Um, so I was just really struck by your comment before about um, being able to celebrate uh, the growing, felling and, and using of, of trees. Um, and I was just wondering if you think that, because I'm coming at this from a, a humanities research perspective, and I was wondering if you think that there's, there needs to be more stories written about, um, about that utility in the woods and also um, if we need the, the if we need more art to encompass the idea of of good stewardship because there's been a real proliferation of uh, literary tree books coming out recently in in bookshops alongside the the boom in nature writing and, and, and public interest in that but a lot of these stories tend to um sometimes fall into that trap of sentimentalizing trees as they're felled i think maybe yeah, I, I mean, I'd love to talk to you further about this. I, I mean, yes, it's definitely a professional passion uh, for me as well, not just for the books, but for the work I do at Silver. I think there is more that needs to be done in, in multiple different ways. So I was gently chastising some of our big NGOs earlier about their, their fear of talking about felling. So I think if they were to embrace it more fully and be bolder, um, I think that would help. But certainly in, this, in a... In a in an artistic and cultural sense, there's more we can do. Um, and, it, and it just translates into all sorts of things. I think getting funding for a project which involves felling trees is difficult, but funding for a project with 
planting trees is the easiest thing you can ever do as a charity. If it involves planting trees, you can get funding for it. And so there's a very deep rooted cultural divide between the two, even though they're so intrinsically linked, aren't they? Um, so I think there is a real challenge there. And I, I personally believe that uh, culture and art has a really important role. Obviously I do, otherwise I wouldn't have written the book. But I think I'd like to see more happening in projects in book writing and film uh, to, to try and connect people reconnect people with trees in that way. And I, we ran a project at Silver called the One Oak Project. And we, it's not a completely original idea. It's been done before in the One Tree Project and then other forms. And we felled a tree uh, at Blenheim Palace, a big oak tree, uh, to tell the story. So over three years, we felled the tree. We witnessed its felling with hundreds of school children on a, on a, in a snowstorm in January. We made films uh, of, of, of it being felled. And then we made 60 products from the tree, took it on a, a tour of Britain up to Edinburgh Botanic Gardens and other places. Uh, and I had some amazing conversations with people because so I'd stand there in front of the film with uh, the tree was being felled and the 400 children were chanting, cut it down because they were really cold and they were bored and they wanted the tree down. They'd had enough standing in the snow. Um, it wasn't a deliberate thing, but it definitely wound up people who found it very challenging anyway. Uh, but I, I found it a very useful canvas to have that conversation with people. And I understood, began to understand maybe people's perceptions. And the conversation would go along the lines of, well, why, you, why did you fill that tree? Well, because it was ready. What do you mean it was ready? Well, it had been growing there for 150 years. It, you know, is now of a size that is harvestable. If we fell it, we can replace it with lots of new trees and then we can use its timber to produce things. But why, why, do, why can't you just leave it there? So then the conversation is, well, how much wood is in your life? Well, what do you mean? Uh, well, have you got wooden doors or windows or floors? Or yes, well, where did you get that wood? Oh, I, I don't know, I didn't think about it. You definitely got it from a forest. Which forest? I don't know. Did you get it from a British forest? I, I don't know. So, you know, there's a whole conversation around there. And not, Tom, Tom and, has opened up a huge topic there. Yeah. Um, I'm just Sorry, going to, just before, no, 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 just before <laughs> I do ask you for, for, for a reading, I think um, Jez has got something on, um, on that, which he might like to share. I've got half a message here, Jez. Uh, just very briefly, if you'd like to, to come in on that. Yeah, so sorry, yes, no, I just wanted to get in touch with Tom, really, really interested in this whole idea of telling stories and in a more contemporary way that isn't quite so sentimentalist in their approach. And it's something we're looking at doing at the moment and putting film and book proposals together to do exactly that. Tom, so get in touch. If Tom's you, happy, perhaps we can put the links together and, and put you yeah, two in yeah. touch if you're both happy to do that. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to do that. I'll put my email in the in the chat now. Um, awesome. Right, and I'm now I'm going to move to Gabriel for your second reading, Gabriel. And okay. just a reminder, anyone who has any questions on anything that appears in the new silver, do put it in the chat, chat function and we'll come to you after that. Uh, Gabriel has very happily said, nicely said he'll stay a little bit longer till sort of 7.15 or so. So we'll, we'll, we'll have the second reading and then perhaps another couple of questions and then we'll talk about the Forest Guide project. Okay. So Gabriel, over to you. All right, I, I, mean, I was just gonna read, I wrote, I read earlier from the start of the book, which will set the scene. I just thought I'd read from the last paragraph, which um, I hope explains what we were trying to do and our vision for the future. So the, the last chapter is called Of Future Forests. All human beings should plant one tree for every year that they live on earth and experience the joy and pride of embracing their massive trunks and sitting under their shady canopies. And a more ultimate life accolade is achieved if your arms cannot reach around the stem of a tree that you planted yourself. Sustainable society is consummate when trees are planted by those too old to benefit. There is no greater legacy save perhaps your own progeny, than bestowing trees founded on your energy and resolve. Instead of mourning the felling of a productive forest tree, let us celebrate the vision of the individual who planted and cared for it, then delight in its myriad products. Every person privileged to own or manage a forest can surely recognize the burden of responsibility 
that they are beholden to provide goods and services as well as guardianship and must work with utmost industry to bequeath this resource in a state superior to that in which it was inherited. Anyone who has a garden, park or orchard tree has an opportunity to ensure that it offers protection, brings beauty, bears fruit for future generations. In short, every one of us should aspire to be a forester. Right, that's that's lovely, Gabriel. And I'm going to pick up on that um, a little bit about your your everyone should aspire to be a forester, because you do talk a little bit about provenance and genetic diversity, uh, and the rule of third for plantings, which I think goes something along the lines of a third local natives, a third natives from other provenances, uh, further afield to increase genetic diversity, and a third non-natives. So my question to you really is how is how do you feel people are doing on understanding the differences, the differences between genetics and provenance, and what more should we perhaps be doing around that? Yeah, that's a super question. Well, um, I mean, I came up with that. I mean, it's, it's simple, probably too simple. Um, but the idea was that diversity will win through. And I, I suppose I have a inherently a concern that we, we sometimes edge towards either old fashioned and simple things, or we rush to the next new modern thing without sort of enough thought. And time and time again in forestry, you can see that. And I think that the genetic component is particularly complicated because it's not necessary in everyone's sort of lexicon. What do we mean by provenance or progeny and what's a half sieve or what's a family or what's a clonal or whatever it might be. So I, I'm very aware that we, we have more to do on that in the forestry sector to make people more comfortable uh, as customers, if you like. And equally, we need to sort of help the nursery trade be better at communicating those things. Um, as ever, it's a bit of a, you know, apple, uh, um, what's the phrase? Um, we both got responsibility to do this. So the customer needs to ask more about it to nurseries and nurseries perhaps need to offer up more choice and be able to respond better to those questions. Um, at the same time, you know, I think, uh, we're, I'm sure we're all aware there is working in forestry on owning mat land at the moment that there's a huge push to plant more trees and concerns about what those might look like and where they're going to go. Um, so I think it's more important than now than ever, really, that we we get it right to come up with a recipe, if you like, and come up with the education and support for people that really helps them through that process. Uh, I don't feel particularly comfortable at the moment. I don't think we're there yet in getting that right. And it's not helped again by some who tend to push one more the other and it can be both different parties it could be those who tend to push exotic uh, exotic and uh, whatever term you might want to use alien or <laughs> novel as much as those who push local and, and native uh, and I think we could be very black and white in our approach we need to be much more robust uh, and think it through and think about the risk and I think it's a risk from both and, and resilience is about having options isn't it yeah. and all of us who maybe inherited a woodland and are managing someone else's vision from a previous generation will know that it's the woods that have variety and were planted with vision that are the woods that can be adapted um, for for future good i can see william nodding yeah i'm going to stick with the future if i may and william please if you want to come in please raise your hand or anything. Um, but I'm going to keep with the future. We've talked about sort of genetics and provenance for the future. But you also mentioned sort of the developments in the market. So things like nanotechnology, nano, and I'll probably say this wrong, nanocrystalline cellulose um, and uses for wood fiber. What, what's exciting you most about that? Where do you think the most opportunities are? I think generally the point is that uh, innovations in technology are opening up new markets. So um, here at the Wood Centre, where I'm talking from tonight, for the Silver Foundation space, we've got some amazing cladding on our some of our renovated buildings from poplar, sycamore, and ash, um, all of which are non-durable timbers you never use and normally outside, but they've been thermally modified, if you like, sort of plasticized, so that they're completely durable. We hope they'll last 20 years with no treatment. They're very attractive. We're finding new markets for low-value timber. That that excites me. As much as it does, um, you know, pulping up timber and turning it into ballistic proof vests and car bumpers, which is also exciting. 
uh, or making lipstick, which we also do from wood pulp these days, or food colourings or food substances. So, you know, I think these are all part of our arsenal. And while we may still want to produce uh, oak frame timbers or roof beams and, and uh, doorways and flooring, finding markets for the byproducts is always really exciting because it can help drive innovation, help drive uh, money into the sector, which we need, as we all know, given the long term investments needed in forestry. Uh, I can see Brian Ellert down in my bottom left with pictures of eucalyptus, I suspect. You know, there's all sorts of interesting, this angle of genetics meeting innovations in technology for, for wood and timber. Um, you know, we've, there's lots of opportunities for us in a future society to make sure that wood plays a central role in helping us become sustainable society. One of the key principles for uh, the future, you know, the, for me, there are three big things. We need to halt biodiversity loss. Um, we need to reduce climate change, but we need to sustain ourselves. We can't pretend otherwise. And it's not just about growing food, but it's about using other fibre and other materials from our forests to help sustain society. I think on that note, um, Gabriel, would it be a good moment now to switch and talk a little bit about your Forest Guides project? Does that fit in nicely with that? Uh, yeah. Um, tell us, yeah, tell us where you me. are, where you are with that, and perhaps how people here tonight might be able to to take part or get involved. Certainly, I'm not sure which slide I'm, I'm showing you that slide. Um, I've, I've got basically this is the uh, I've written other books, so I, I've dabbled in fiction, so you can see a few books here. <laughs> Um, and this is one I wrote about a plant hunter, Green Gold. Um, I guess my most comfortable area is still working in, in non-fiction. So my next project um, is called The Forest Guide. And I um, ridiculously, I admit, pitched this idea to Bloomsbury that I wanted to write a sort of a, a modern um, doomsday book for woodlands. So I'd, I'd like to capture a, a register of every single woodland in Britain. Uh, of course, it's a ridiculous idea and no one would publish it. Um, anyway, to sort of cut a long story short, uh, the idea came together to have a much more focused book around woodlands that the general public could visit, um, while still fulfilling my ambition, which was in a very different way to the new silver, which is based around concepts and forestry and that, and didn't really deal with the site so much. This is sort of the other angle of it. So what woodlands do we have and what, what are their qualities and, and what about the story of those who own it? So I really wanted to find a way to celebrate the role of the woodland owner and the woodland manager in caring for our woodlands. Because I think that, you know, back to the discussion we had earlier with Tom and, and Jez, you know, I think the role of the woodland owner and manager is critical in that and their vision and their aspirations. So the forest guide uh, is at the moment, Scotland focus. So I've got a contract for one book. I've now produced, uh, I've visited 365 sites and written them up. So it's a combination of my photography um, and a very often quite a short entry about a woodland, where it is, what to see when you get there, maybe some stories about its silver culture or its sort of natural um, naturalness. Um, and this will be coming out in uh, 2023, so about a year's time. Uh, but I hope very much this will be a book which then would there be uh, additional volumes looking at England and Wales. So I've been running this for a year now and I've got a, a website where wooden owners some, can offer up their sites for inclusion. Obviously, it's wooden owners who are happy with the public coming to their sites. And that's very much a personal decision. In Scotland, of course, it's slightly different with free to roam. But in England, Wales, of course, there's a network of permitted um, of public access sometimes woodland owners have permitted access as well. So I'm always looking for woodland owners to register a woodland and they can provide me all the details they want. Equally, you can suggest a woodland for inclusion. So it might be one that you just love visiting yourself. Um, and I have this offer for people to become a book patron. So uh, if you put some money to my research time, then your name will be printed or name of a, a loved one would be printed in the, in the front of the book to say thank you as a mark of appreciation. So that's live and as a website that people can look at and, and um, see what they think. 
and that's it Wendy really. Okay no that's great and I hope that at least some people tonight will will want to um take part so I don't know if you can non stop your your sure. screen sharing is that yeah um, and in just in the last few minutes, um, I'm going to come up with a couple more questions for you, Gabriel. And it is a last chance for anyone who hasn't put a question in who would like to, to please do so. Um, so I thought um, I, would, I would ask you a question about the stop-start nature of um, woodlands. And this really harks back a little bit to in John Evelyn's time, it was timber for um uh, war um for the navy and then we had um trees for there was um we needed to to plant hugely after the first world war um and now we're looking to to mitigate climate change so um you make the point that governments change 10 to 14 times in a single forest rotation so we're not having a lot of stability if you like while you plant grow, harvest, plant, grow, harvest. So, so um, you know, how could we sort of smooth out these, these stops and starts? And I know this is a huge and very political question, so I'm not expecting one answer, but I'm just wondering, you know, how, how you see that happening, particularly as we have the, the, the various sort of, you know, planting plans at the moment and the tree strategy, um, all of that. Would you like a comment on that one? Yeah, it is a big area to talk about. I. I think the thing I, I suspect those um, owners amongst this group will recognise, I think, often the, the vision and stability that an estate, a traditional estate provides, you know, when it's passed down through generations, when sometimes they've been able to ride over fashions and trends or um, the vagaries of grants and incentives coming and going. They're, they're the ones that tend to provide the long term stability to British forestry. It's those who can't afford to do that. You have to chase, them, chase the money in grants or incentives, or uh, you know maybe being less kind, those who follow them anyway, and end up doing rather weird things like planting trees too wide and adopting weird mixtures because it's the, that's what the grant will pay for. Um, so in short, the answer is, you know if, if we can find a way to support people better so they're not reliant on you know some of these, um, here today, gone tomorrow, kind of policies and incentives, um, then it will improve. I, I do, that straying anywhere into politics, really, I, I do feel more positive today than I have, I think, for any time in my career about government listening. Uh, and certainly I've been involved in for many years in consultations with government on forestry matters. And certainly in the past, it's felt like lip service to tick a box. And I have to say in the last few years, it really does feel like there's been more thought put into it. That doesn't mean that can just be whipped away when the next government comes in and, and so on uh, as ever before. Um, but I, I do feel generally quite optimistic at the moment. Our challenge for forestry, of course, is so multifaceted that it's not only dealing with the vagaries of policies coming and going, but the increasing challenges of pests and diseases, including squirrel and ash dieback, and as well as the opportunities to market. So it's a fantastically complicated uh, and thoroughly stimulating um, thing to be involved in. And, and there's never an easy answer, is there? <laughs> I love I love to end on an optimistic note, Gabriel. So the fact that you're more optimistic than anything else than, than you have been for a long time is uh, great. I'm going to ask one last question. Um, oh no, I've got two last questions I'm going to ask. I'm going to go to Mike Dando first. Mike, you are you there? Oh yeah, yeah, just um, what you were saying there, Gabriel, about kind of starts and stops. Um, wouldn't continuous cover help with that though, rather than the planting, clear, foul, start, stop, start, stop? Yes. <laughs> that's that short sharp <laughs> to the point brilliant absolutely yeah i'm a big fan of <laughs> news cover or any in any of its guises but we, we also have to recognize it's not simple is it so by its very nature it's a complex system so therein lies challenges for us in the sector to improve education and support we give to owners and and improve our technologies around that so but i, I you know i really think it, it 
for many reasons, continuous cover in some form is great for resilience, for reducing risk, for biodiversity, for landscape, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, and yeah. forest soils. Forest soils, yeah. Water, flood alleviation, carbon sequestration, you name it, it's great. Thanks. So one just one last point, um, I think from Roy, um, a technical a technical question here. Um, Roy, are you there? Roy Lorraine Smith? Um, I can't answer it. So Gabriel, I hope you can. Um, Roy, where are you? Has he left us? Perhaps I'm he's here. left. I'm here. Oh, you're here. There you are, Lorraine. Yes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Gabriel, I was foxed by one of your abbreviations in your book. Um, opposite the illustration of the true cedar, you say, referring to the ornamental qualities of true cedar, you say CPV. Now, what on earth does that mean? Do you mean the letter C or the word C? No, I mean S E E R uh, space P dot V. I don't know. I tell you what, Gabriel. I don't know how to look that up, aren't I? But you can look up and come back to 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 Roy later. Yeah. Let us know the answer, and we can certainly send it through. Thanks for stumping me with the last question. That's genius. <laughs> okay, so so um, thank you, thank you, Gabriel, for for this evening and for staying on a little bit later. Uh, thank you to everybody who's been with us tonight. It's been great to see you. Um, we do have a, another book club based on the 8th of March with the um, fabulous ecologist, uh, George Peterkin. So we'll be looking then at the long-term study of Lady Park Wood and Lady Park Wood and the Arboralist artists. So I hope you can all join us for that. That will be absolutely fascinating. Um, so I think probably all that remains to be said is that we will be sending you a, um, a link to the recording in a day or two um, and we look forward to seeing you back in March so thank you all very much indeed and I'll say goodbye now thank you Gabriel thank you Bye. <laughs>